because like in this in this movement and i'm sure you've experienced this too especially when you first get into this movement there's a big emphasis on like self-sufficiency and independence and i can do all this by myself and i don't need nobody but the biggest lesson that i've truly learned in the last five years um is that i do absolutely need people you know like people like Kat and even you, like you gave, gave me work in 2019 when everybody else was too afraid to hire me. Well, that work is how I survived, you know, or all the people that donated to me, like, but also just like the friends that I've made, you know, like I, this year, um, there's been some beautiful things that have happened. Well, this year as in 2023, there were some really beautiful things here and there that happened. But it was a really hard year for, year for me, you know, like, it started off kind of turbulent, got better, you know, I fell in love, but the universe gate fucking joke is just like, hi, we're going to give you the most healthy and fulfilling relationship you've ever had, but by the way, he's literally on the other side of the planet 90, 98% of the time, you're going to be lonely as fuck. And without these people, like, without my roommate, without Henza being close by, um, without the people that I train with in the circus, this year would have fucking sucked. You know, like, I have felt so loved. And it's funny, because, like, I posted some videos on social media about this, but after my performance in July with my, with my circus people, um, they were all, like, kind of watching from the inside, and I had, a, I had my first solo. It was a solo on trapeze. And when I came back in, and they were already doing this for months at like parties and stuff, they scream, yeah, or Lily, or Mana, yeah, it is Mexicana, which means Lily, sister, you are Mexican. And they like all bombarded me and hugged me, singing that at me. And it's just like, the community that I have now worldwide, you know, like all of these, like, we need community to really thrive in this world. If we all just try to fucking do everything ourselves, we end up miserable, angry, and bitter. Um, so yeah, I like that you've made this directory, and I like that it's not just a, oh, only if they accept crypto, or only this. Like, no, if they're good people that do good business, and are trustworthy, and that you know are, you know, gonna, you can trust them to know, like, like anybody that I go to my gym with, they could just call and have me deported. Mm -hmm. And they all know my story now. And the exact opposite of what I feared would happen has happened. Basically, they've embraced me. I've become closer to all of them now. Um, they invite me into their homes, to their family functions, to their birthday parties. They're coming with me to Acapulco now, so we're going to perform together and just like it's it's been really heartwarming it's been mm -hmm. super heartwarming to like just lean into that community aspect a little bit. it's That's so to funny hear. to see and i think it's like yeah i think it's like the second wave of this community because we are we all start off as individuals but then we at a certain point we realize not only does it suck being all by yourself it's just so much better having a good community of people you trust and i know the biggest thing that I've gotten out of being involved in this movement is I have a long list of people that I know for a fact, because I've had to, that I can trust with my life. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane Rayo2, coming to you from the Fear Public of Pasnia, the self liberator's paradise. Uh, for more information on this parallel network currently being built, just visit Paznia, P A Z N I A dot com. On that note, there are a couple updates. Uh, first off, the first iteration of the Paznia map and directory is now available for vetted Paznians and self liberators. It looks beautiful, I must say, and uh, more locations are being added often. Uh, truly an important step. Uh, if you haven't gotten login credentials from me yet, and think you should, uh, please do reach out. I uh, probably just missed you somehow. Uh, DM or email uh, coordinator at Paznia dot com. And uh, if you already have or gain access, uh, check it out, and please consider adding a location or two yourself. Uh, the form to do that is paznia.com forward slash join. Uh, second, let me get the proper screen up on OBS here. But uh, yeah, second, I want to plug something that will only be timely until January 24th. 
Uh, some of you may have seen the Paznia Network mutual aid request for former and future Vanu, uh, Vanu podcast host Kyle Reardon. Uh, long story short, he's going through a really rough time. Uh, he and his wife are separating. Uh, he found out on New Year's Eve, in fact, and uh, he had to quick find another job in a different city, locate a new apartment, and uh, we'll have to reestablish his entire life. Uh, as of right now, we've raised uh, $1,302 out of the needed 1700 to secure his new Vonu home base in Bitcoin, Monero, Silver, uh, and also a little Fiat. So yeah, if you're feeling called to help out, uh, just visit uh, vonupodcast.com forward slash Kyle uh, to find a number of ways to donate. Uh, and the deadline for this is January 24th, uh, but hopefully we'll be done a few days ahead for logistics. I mean, it's been 24 hours, and uh, we're already like, I don't know what that was at, 90, 95% of the way there, so... Um, yeah, huge thanks to everyone who's uh, made this fund fundraising campaign a huge success, um, even if we aren't at 100% quite yet. Uh, I feel like this was sort of a last-ditch effort for him, and uh, he's truly mind-blown by the support. And uh, yes, once he gets settled, uh, he will rejoin the podcast. Uh, so uh, yeah, exciting times. Exciting times ahead. <clears throat> uh, again, vonnypodcast.com forward slash Kyle. Uh, please consider helping out a fellow longstanding uh, self-liberator. Uh, anyway, today, I welcome back another returning guest and friend, uh, Lily Forrester. Uh, for most, she really needs no introduction, especially after her life was chronicled on HBO's The Anarchist. Uh, but for those who uh, that, that for those new that might have missed our last our past couple discussions, uh, Lily is an agorist who fled the U.S. following cannabis drug charges. Um, she uh, fled to Acapulco, Mexico with her now late partner, uh, John Galton. Uh, after years of working on an anarchist community in Acapulco, uh, in February 2018, tragedy struck. Uh, gunfire erupted at that beautiful mountaintop house uh, overlooking Acapulco Bay. And uh, John was killed and Jason Henzo was seriously injured. And uh, of course, following that, uh, life was quite tumultuous for a time as, like Kyle LaBeouf, she had to reestablish her entire life uh, in the face of you know, seriously intense trauma. Uh, we got most of that story from the HBO documentary, documentary but today, I'd like to get a more, more of a feel for where Lily is today and what she's doing. Uh, and more specifically, after surviving everything she has so far, um, what has she learned? Uh, you know, and what are her current perspectives, outlooks, hobbies, uh, interests, etc.? So without further ado, Lily, welcome back to the uh, Vani Podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing pretty good. Doing pretty good. Um, yeah, just in the mad dash getting ready for Anarchapulco this year and all the stuff that comes with it, especially because I be, I'm performing with my circus family and everything. That's going to be a, oh, wow. <laughs> uh, the, the idea of doing like a co-producing job and also being performer two of the five nights. It's just like, okay, I like, I like to challenge myself. <laughs> yeah. Certainly, certainly. So yeah, let's, let's get into that. I mean, I've, I've seen some of the stuff on Twitter, um, of what you've, uh, what you've been up to nowadays, but, um, yeah, you know, what's, uh, um, you know, tell us what, what, a uh, what a day in the life, uh, in Mexico is, uh, for you today. Uh, what are you up to and, uh, is life good? Um, so yeah, life, my life currently is actually even very different than it was a year ago. Like anybody who's watched the series knows the series ended with me being in a relationship with this, uh, kind of tall fellow that ended this year for the better. Um, I, I switched a lot of life priorities. I've talked to you about this privately a little bit, but like, I've been on like this hormone health journey cause I quit birth control and took back mm -hmm. control of my body basically. And so it's been a year of just learning how to support myself, um, while finding balance with work. So at this point, you know, a year ago, I would get out of bed at five in the morning and work until nine o'clock at night. And now my days, they start slow. They start relaxing in bed. And then they, you know, I make myself breakfast. I have a roommate. So I generally talk to him for a while because he likes to talk a lot. Um, and then I get to work and I'm still somehow getting more done than I was a year ago, working less time, which is kind of a little bit of a mind boggling thing to me at this point. <laughs> But yeah, I, I work and then I go and I train with my circus family, um, which <laughs> that has been a fun journey because when I started with them in 2021, they just thought I was some like weird, overly dedicated gringa. And then the series came out and the day that the series came, started coming out, July 10th also happened to be the day of my first show ever that I did with them. So I performed that day. And I said nothing, absolutely nothing to my teacher about the series. Cause like, how do you tell your teacher that you are, 
your life is being chronicled on <laughs> HBO and that you're an illegal and <laughs> okay, <laughs> like okay. you witnessed the murder and all of these other crazy things about my story. So I just kind of like let that fly in the wind for a while. And uh, he found out because somebody at his gym was just like, have you ever Googled that girl, that like white girl that works at your, or that, that comes to your gym? And he's like, why would I do that? You know, like she's just some gringa. And they're like, you should probably, you should probably look into her. Um, and he did. And he found all of the you know news stories and the series and he watched the series and he took about like two months or not two months like two weeks to try to figure out like what do you say to somebody that like was doing all of that and just didn't say anything and then he finally did and we had to talk about it and since then the rest of the girls have found out so I'm kind of like I'm the token anarchist and the, but they all love me for it. Um, to the point now to where when helicopters fly over my gym, which they sometimes do, they all look at me like they coming they're for you? here for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Or the, or, or the one day we were talking about it, one girl walks in class and she's on her phone and Roberto like looks at me and he's like, she's on the phone with immigration. <laughs> like, and she was like, huh? And I was like, she wouldn't do that to me, you know, <laughs> but now it's, you know, he, whenever he tells the story, he says, uh, and I'm going to say it badly because I, I understand Spanish, but I don't speak it very well. But he says it's the, it's the chisme más jugosa in el historia de Kailus, which means the juiciest gossip in the history of Kailus. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so I just kind of, my days are actually kind of like normal and chill and um I just, I have a lot of jobs that I work. One of them, a surprisingly normie job. Like I somehow got a job in PR. I still don't quite understand that. <laughs> um, but yeah, I just kind of get stuff done. Occasionally I have video dates with my long distance agorist boyfriend and I'm working on getting my legal situation fixed so I can move to a place that I will keep somewhat private in Europe. <laughs> Understood. And yeah. Yeah. Sure. Well, cool. So, so I guess met Mexico to Europe, somewhere in Europe, potentially that's, uh, um, that's, that's definitely interesting. Um, definitely interesting. Um, so I suppose, uh, no, it's kind of funny. Um, yeah, I, I imagine it's probably kind of, um, you know, things are normal, but yeah, you're kind of talking about some of the experiences with being, you know, with all the st all stuff that they Googled. Um, but yeah, no, I always have to give Henza a little shit. Anytime, anytime he like shows up at a Pazni assembly, a HBR star, HBO star, Jason Henza. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's, it's, yeah, it's still kind of, kind of, yeah, even though it's not even, not even about me, but it's still just kind of surreal since, you know, like why, why is, you know, that, that there's, yeah, that it even got looked at anyway. But, um, I guess we, we can get to that momentarily. I got a couple more questions just about what you're, what you're doing now. So you mentioned working for Anarchapulco. Um, I guess, you know, you want to talk a little bit about that and, uh, I mean, and give us the update on, on Anarchapulco because five years ago I would not recommend it to people. So, um, I guess, yeah, tell us what's, what's new and, and, uh, I guess, yeah, I guess what, what you're doing with that. So yeah, in 2020, at the end of 2020, um, like I knew all of 2020 that if Anarchapulco continued because Jeff considered stopping it because of the pandemic, he just didn't want to deal with it anymore. And it was, a, it's a lot of work. Um, but throughout 2020, like my best friend, Kat, Kat, Kat Bleichbone and Dean, she, uh, was messaging Jeff on almost a weekly basis. And he kept saying, no, we're not doing it. No, we're not doing it. And then finally in December, he messages her and was like, let's do it. Um, which she promptly pretty much immediately messaged me and was like, I need your help. So I joined the team at the end of 2020 as basically just like a virtual assistant. I was just doing admin tasks and like just random stuff. Um, but by the end of that, the year 2021, like the event in 2021, she was introducing me as a co-producer because I ended up taking on so much responsibility that I fit the role. Mm -hmm. um, then for the 2022 year, like right after the 2021 event, I took over the website and I essentially rebuilt the website and we built a, like, because we have the replay system. So I had to build a login system and then everything for WordPress. I took over the email list. Um, 2022, I didn't go to Anarchapulco because I was afraid to travel. And yeah, it's just kind of evolved 
basically I kind of do, I do sponsorships for Anarchapulco. I do the website. I co-produce. Um, yeah, I do. I do. It's, it's kind of a mountain of stuff because it's one of those things like I am so hyper productive and I do things so like well that every time we've tried to delegate some of my tasks, it ends up taking me longer to explain how to do the task yeah, to somebody I else than it takes me to actually do it. Yeah. <laughs> so I just so I just do it all, uh, which is a little exhausting. But yeah, we're going into our tenth anniversary, and as many people may or may not know, we had like I'm not in Acapulco anymore, but um, Acapulco got utterly fucking sacked oh, by yeah. a category. Hurricane. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure category five hurricane, and like. It was one of those things where, like, I was like, oh, it got hit by a hurricane. I, it got hit by hurricanes when I lived there. But, like, it took me, like, a day or two to really, like, look at to see the damage. And I was actually on TikTok, and it started showing me, like, videos of the Crosteta. And I was just like, oh, shit. Like, this is this is really bad. And it, it, looks, like, it looks like the apocalypse hit mm. there. Um, it's really bad i'm pretty sure the government is estimating like 15 billion dollars in damage and i don't think that's an exaggeration i think that actually might be like a conservative estimate um between all the cleanup and the damage to the buildings and you know i've talked to people that were there they said they saw tourists flying out of hotels and stuff they claim like less than 100 dead but there's there was definitely more than that. Um, governments do like to lie about those things, but in some ways it looked worse than in terms of like just utter damage because those buildings are all metal and glass. Uh, I think it was worse than Katrina um, in terms of the devastation. It, they're like, it's still a mess. I'm seeing like they, they post photos, like they post a photo of like this statue in the middle of the main bay that, and it's like Acapulco is okay again, but like when you really like pay attention to the details of the photo, it still looks like the apocalypse hit. Mm. Like, yeah, you guys sweep the streets, but like that building there is missing most of its windows, and it's one of the nicer buildings in the main bay. Um, so it's kind of surreal, but and we almost were like, maybe we shouldn't hold it in Acapulco this year. We considered Mexico City, but. Our venues assured us that they would be ready, and we decided that it would probably be the right thing to do to try to hold the event there anyway. So, you know, we sent some of our people down there. Henza went down there and helped. Um, our other co-producer, Rebecca, went down there to assess things to make sure, one, you know, that the people that take care of us there are taken care of, but also to really, like... Are, can they actually be ready for us? And we determined then, like, yeah, they they can. It's gonna be, it's gonna be kind of heavy being down there and all of that. But but they can absolutely host us still. Um, so we are still holding it. There are a lot of people that are like, oh, it's not happening, but it definitely is. Um, maybe for the last year, Jeff has been saying every year for the last several years that he thinks it's the last year, but this year feels different. Um, so I think it might be, hmm. but it's the 10th anniversary, which is kind of crazy to consider. This is my ninth in Arcapulco. Um, and yeah, like I mentioned, um, I will be performing twice with my circus people. So it's, it's kind of funny cause like they, they all saw the story, the series, and now they're going to go down and be immersed in that world, which is kind of you know, it's going to be a full circle moment, you know, because it's like, yeah, these are the people that took care of me when I first moved to Mexico. A lot of them they will have seen in the series. And then it's like, OK, all of you people, because everybody last year, they're like, wow, you look so different. You look so strong. You look so happy. What changed? Well, what changed is I have, you know, a community here that's not just a bunch of scared and angry gringos because i mean let's face it like most of the gringos leave in the united states these days are scared and angry um <laughs> True. and it leads to a certain vibe whereas like the people that i train with they're a lot of them are normies but they they're really good people and they get shit done and they take care of each other um there's no drama there's no scamming and stuff that can happen in these communities 
But yeah, we're I'll be performing twice. This year will be the second year that the fork has been brought back. Um, it's been re- renamed Agora Forko instead of Anarcha Forko, which for oh, me, okay, um, cool, it's coming back too. Yeah, it, we we did it last year and and it was awesome. I set up the calendar literally the same way I set up the calendar in 2018 and 2019. Um, and yeah, it's the second week of Anarcha Forko. So the first week, um. The opening night party is the 11th. The actual conference is from the 12th to the 16th. And then from the 17th to the 23rd is the fork. And it is literally set up the way that it was. And it is just as hard getting people to understand because everybody in the in the chat's like, so where's the fork happening? It's a secret garden. And it's like, no, it's not that kind of event. Where do you want the fork to happen? Like, <laughs> But... Enough people got it last year because I personally put five events on the calendar because I didn't know how it was going to do. So I wanted there to be something to do, to do. But I counted at the end of the week and there was more than 70 different events. So 65 other than the ones that I posted during that week on the calendar. Yeah. So it was a success. Um, it was definitely a success, especially for me because that's, actually how I met my um, long distance Eggers boyfriend. Uh, <laughs> he, he saw the series and that's, it's funny because people ask me all the time, they're like, what did you, what did you get out of the series? Like, how much did you get paid? And I'm like, well, it was a documentary, like not a reality show. So I didn't get paid. Uh, but what I did get was, you know, my boyfriend would have never known I existed otherwise, but he watched the series and he was like, wow, I've got to, I've got to meet this girl. And he came all the way from, uh, we'll just say middle of Europe, mm-hmm. like deep in Europe to Mexico. Um, and he was one of the few people that bought a fork only ticket. We actually didn't do a fork only ticket la- this year because only five people bought. Everybody else just did general admission or VIP so they could go to the conference too. Um, but he was one of the few people that bought the fork only ticket and he came to my events and, you know, that was a somewhat slow start to our relationship. Um, so it is possible to find love at the fork, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's what Anna Capulco is up to these days. Um, we'll see what happens for next year. There's like, I, I feel torn personally. There's a big part of me that is a little bit exhausted after nine years of Anarchapulco and wouldn't mind finding something else to focus a lot of my efforts on. But there's also that other part of me that's like, I've gotten best friends out of it. I've gotten so much work out of it. I've now got love out of it. Like so much of what my life currently is started with me going to Anarchapulco in 2016. So it's, Mm -hmm. It's like, okay, I'm torn. Uh, I think part of me will be relieved if we don't do it next year. But uh, I think part of me will be also sad if we don't. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. Yeah, I, I resonate with a lot of that. Um, but I guess more so with the, I guess, the Michigan Peace and Liberty, or I guess the Midwest Peace and Liberty Fest up in Michigan. Um, so I've been going to that since yeah, 2015. So, yeah, similar there. And, yeah, I, I met my wife there and everything. So, yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, you know everyone that's with that like the first layer of, of the Pazni network, the first layer of trust is ma- mainly people I met there. So, um, yeah, it's it's critical at everything that I'm doing. Yeah, so I, I I resonate with that a lot for sure. Um, so that's cool. Um, it's cool to hear all you're doing now. Anna Anna Capulco is doing good, and uh, that um, you know Acapulco is doing you know better, I suppose, and that some things are getting back to somewhat normal there. So, um, because I I looked at um. I uh, I looked at a couple. I went to the uh, Telegram chat um, for Anarchapulco and looked at a couple of videos from there of like the helicopter flybys of the coast. And I was like, holy shit, it actually is really bad. Because um, a lot of that stuff, you know, the media likes to overblow and stuff. But that was one case. So I don't think the media was actually covering that. So, um, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, the media good. was not covering how bad it was, but it was really devastatingly awful. Like, mm-hmm. I was floored and I still am I'm a little bit like because it's that place is already kind of a trauma bucket for me and then like to go back and it's just like to see it devastated is gonna be it's gonna be tough I can already feel it um 
but I also can already feel the fact that the community there is going to be grateful that we are still going to come and spend our money because they need it yeah, now sure. more than ever. Yeah. yeah, certainly. Certainly. So yeah, I guess we, we've been going for, uh, for 20, 21 minutes so far, which is great. You know, that was a good, you know, a very good start. Um, glad, you know, glad things seem to go, seem to be going really, really well on all fronts. So, um, I guess let's, let's back up a bit to, um, the documentary experience. Um, so yeah, tell, tell us a bit about what, uh, what that was like and, uh, what your thoughts were on, uh, the final product. Oh man. Um, the whole thing was weird from the beginning because it was like, oh, okay, you know, at first it was like, okay, this is an interview. We don't think it's going to turn into anything, but they kept coming back and we're like, all right, we'll do the interviews. Don't think it's going to turn into anything. And then the murder happened and then I was just like, okay, well, it's probably going to turn into something. And during those days, Thaddeus Russell, who's a, still a good friend of mine, he was like, yeah, it's definitely going to turn into something big. I'm pushing them to get it put on something like Netflix or something. And I'm like, ah, that seems like a lot. <laughs> and that costs money. Like, And they were paying up until, I think, mid-2021, I want to say. Yeah, mid-2021, up until then, they were paying for everything out of pocket all of their flights down the equipment everything that they were doing every time that they came down to film in those save for like the, the end interview which like you see bits of that throughout the series it's like where i'm sitting in this red chair in a black dress and i have my hair and my glasses like and all of that that was the only interview that was paid for by investors, but everything else that they did was out of their personal pocket. Um, and I know there are a lot of people out there that are like, HBO framed all of this. You know, we got Howard Lichman that's like, HBO manufactured oh, this entire yeah. situation, including the murder, to make the, to make the community look bad. And it's like, nah, like, it was literally just two people paying out of their pocket, partially because, like, they became friends with us and, you know, they were all, they were just hanging out with their friends. That was the big part of it. And then the murder happened and they were like, okay, you know, I, we're going to continue with this. And, uh, yeah, that, I mean, the whole thing was just surreal, like being surrounded by cameras and then they kept coming back and, um, it was kind of always like in the back of my head, like, should I really be doing this? You know, because after the murder, I was like, okay, it is going to end up somewhere big. Um, is it really a smart idea for me to be bragging about being a fugitive on international television? <laughs> that was a that was a constant, a big fucking question in my head the whole time. And I'm like, but there's something in my head that was telling me, like, no, you need to do this, follow through with it. And I'm like, okay, so. We did that final interview in 2021 and like in, I want to say April of 2022, which was months before it was told, anybody was told that it was going to be on HBO because I was in such a delicate situation. HBO gave them permission to tell me under the stipulation that I wasn't allowed to tell nobody, but I, I knew from April that it was going to be on HBO. Um <laughs> So it was just like, okay. And it was funny because like, you know, my, my friends that I work with all know who I am, but really the people I was spending all of my time with in person, because I, I go like three to four days a week to these circus classes and their like social things that we do outside of them. I was just like immersed in like this Mexican group that just, they just thought I was some like normie white lady that didn't want to live in the United States. And it's just like, we're training for this show together. And I remember a, a couple weeks before the show, Mexican local news came in to one of our classes. And my teacher, and he, he knows I'm socially awkward. So he was like, Lily, we're going to have cameras in class. You know, like, I just don't want you to act weird. <laughs> like, don't get weirded out by the cameras. And in my brain, I'm just like, you have no fucking clue. <laughs> like, because cause the last interview I did with the anarchists that, like, where bits or pieces are shown throughout all the series, that was a two-day interview of 10 hours per day in front of 
five or six cameras and a crew of like 20 people that like when I went into those interviews, yeah. that was when I knew it was going to be big. You know, I was like, oh, shit, because I knew they got investing. And then I'm like, there's about four more cameras than there were last time and about 10 times as many people literally like this is going to be a thing. Got a big budget real quick. Um, so, yeah, it was fun. It got real big budget real quick, and um, <laughs> and I have a funny story that I heard about my dad in regards to that, too, because my dad is where I get my social awkwardness from. But by the time this happened, like, I had been so used to being followed around by cameras, especially by these people, that I got over it. Um, and, yeah, we did that class, and my teacher's like, wow, I'm impressed, you know, because he told me at one point, because he did an interview, like, they filmed parts of the class, and they did an interview, and he looks at me and he's like, you either need to get out of the way or do something interesting behind me. And I was like playing with the trapeze. So I was just sitting there doing stuff on the trapeze. And after class, he was like, you were a lot more comfortable in front of the cameras than I expected. And I was just like, uh-huh, yeah. <laughs> like, yep. Yeah. Um, which my dad, he's he's awkward about that and there is you know they rented out an entire diner for my dad's exit interview that they put him in and there's like they were trying to get the scene of him driving in like with his truck and from the drone and they're like act natural and he's like uh okay so he drives in and as he drives in he's like staring at the drone <laughs> they had to redo that like 10 or 15 times like please stop looking at the drone we need you to drive in as if there's not a drone filming you like come <laughs> on <laughs> um which is hilarious yeah. um and that was also funny that's actually how i got back in touch with my dad because i hadn't talked to him the entire time i lived in mexico it had been five years hmm. or it had been four yeah about five years actually so documentary series is like hey this is 2019 like two or three months after the murder they're like hey we want to interview your dad i'd already put him in touch with my sister they're like we also want to interview your dad and i'm like well i haven't talked to my dad like he doesn't know what happened and they're like well get in touch with him and i was like how the fuck do i do that so i had my sister call him and tell him what happened um and then i called him after and yeah, his first words were, what the fuck, Miranda? Because it's like, <laughs> but I'm like, so are you going to go and meet up with this documentary crew? And he's like, yeah, I guess. And then it got really big budget and they're both like, oh, wow. Okay. Um, so that's a thing. And I, I wasn't even able to tell them when I knew it was going to be on HBO. I had to wait until the official announcements right before those went out. And then I was able to tell them like, hey, dad, by the way, you're going to be on HBO. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, and that was just a whole thing. Like, it was it was weird because, like, it went from, a, you know, some of the stuff, like, we... I wouldn't say it was necessarily staged, but it was set up in a way to where, like, when my dad came to Acapulco, I wasn't allowed to go pick him from, from the airport because they wanted to have yeah. control over filming the reunion. So I had to wait with Mike on my, on my, like, clipped onto me for Henza to go pick my dad up from the airport and bring him to the house that mm -hmm. we were staying at so they could film it and do their cinematic shot. There were a few other things like that. And it's weird, like, you know, that's a big moment. And it's like, it was weird having to plan it around a camera crew being there. That was mm -hmm. very strange. Um, and they also asked, they're like, hey, can we come to your class and film you in class? And I'm like, man, I don't know how to explain to my teacher that I have a documentary crew following me around. <laughs> like, I don't know about that. So I didn't end up doing it, which he's a little mad at me about because he's, you know, he's like this sassy, sassy gay man who's like, I am a star. And he wanted to be in it, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and then the series came out and it was just like hundreds of messages for weeks on end like pouring in and i replied to pretty much every one of them much to people's surprise because i basically decided like if i were somebody trying to mess message somebody like me that i looked up to i would want a response um so i like 
and still to this day, I still respond and I still get messages. I get a few a week compared to hundreds a week. Um, but yeah, it, it changed a lot. And then it also changed nothing. Like my daily life is still pretty, pretty similar to what it was beforehand with certain, certain differences. Um, I do feel like now that my teacher and my my classmates know about the series that I can authentically be myself. Um, they've even all started trying to call me my birth name, Miranda, again. Um, that series got the attention of the local newspaper in the area where I was arrested, the Akron Beacon Journal, and uh, somebody from there contacted me, and they ended up doing a two-part front page of the newspaper oh, wow. series about me, which was... That was awesome. Um, honestly, it was pretty fucking cool, and it's how I got my lawyer. So I have a, I have a pretty badass lawyer. Um, she's known for getting innocent people out of prison. Like when I found her, somebody sent me her Instagram, and the first post that was there was like a post of her with her goddaughter, who basically wouldn't exist if she hadn't gotten her father out of prison. And I was like, okay, which that whole thing, like, I don't know how much you believe in the spiritual stuff in tarot, but like a tarot reader who saw the story and offered me a free reading predicted my lawyer with like 100% accuracy. Yeah. Which is kind of crazy. She, she basically told me she was like, you're going to get a female lawyer. She's going to be a badass. Um, and you're going to hear about it within a week. And I was like, ain't no fucking way. Like I had been trying for years at that point to get a lawyer and, and none of the prospects were female, literally not a single one. And I was like, yeah, whatever lady. It's like, <laughs> whatever. And then somebody ma randomly messaged me and was like, Hey, you might want to check into this woman. Like she could probably help you. And I got in touch with her after the Akron Beacon Journal thing and I was like this is this is the deal like can you help you know other lawyers have told me it cost 25 grand and she's like that's bullshit because there's no reason that this should cost that much it might take a while but I'm gonna charge you five grand and keep it at a flat rate because I know you don't have a lot and we'll we'll get working on it um nice which I'm still, I'm still like waiting for a lot of things with that. But it's also, it's an eight-year-old case. And she has other cases that are happening like right now that she's had to prioritize over it. But she's extremely effective. Like yesterday, she posted about how she got some guy that had a felony one, two, and two felony threes. So almost as many felonies as I had, but worse felonies because I didn't have a felony one. Um, but she posted about how she got him acquitted of all of those crimes. She seems pretty confident in that. But at this point, I'm like, give me a fucking plea deal. I would rather just move on with my life and not go to jail. I've got plans and they're all on pause right now. So I'm like sitting here trying to stoically zen it out until my legal situation gets fixed. But mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's brought a lot of beauty, beauty into my life. Um, I expected it to make things complicated for me legally in terms of like Mexico, but the Mexican government does not seem to give a fiddly flying fuck about it. <laughs> um, nothing has changed in that regard, especially cause like if they wanted to find me, it is not that hard to find out exactly where I am and where I train to camp out and get my ass out of the country if they mm -hmm. really wanted to. Um, so yeah, I'm just kind of chilling out um and then as far as the final product i mean the thing that i will say about the series because there are a lot of people that are like oh they sensationalized it and they made it all about the drama the thing is they're like oh you know you got larkin and amanda like oh they just focused on the drama when there was good things happening in Anarchapulco, something that they don't understand is people that literally only came to Anarchapulco was Anarchapulco was seven days out of 365. And the other three, the 300 and like 50 something days were exactly what the series showed. It was fucking drama. It was fucking like struggle. Like 
the the things that I wish that the series maybe could have done a little bit more accurately was when talking about the theory behind the murder, they did completely uh, gloss over, and they said it was because they couldn't prove it, but they also couldn't prove Lisa Th- Freeman's theory about me selling cocaine either. Um, but I had a local contact that's really connected. I'm actually still friends with him, and he was asking around after the murder. And he contacted me about six weeks after the murder and was like, what do you think happened? And I was like, honestly, at this point, I don't even know, you know. And he was like, well, I was asking around and people were saying this crazy guy named Paul paid some people to go and do that. And I had never mentioned Paul's name to him, not even once. Uh, so and he, that was he independent. Came up with that. Wow. Yeah. Completely independent from the movement, like nobody else knew him. I knew him because I actually like most people don't know this, but I worked at a smoke shop when I first lived in Acapulco for like a couple months. Um, and it ended, ended up temporarily closing down. They're open now again, which is good to hear. I heard from him for the first time in a couple of years, like a, like two weeks ago. Um, but yeah, it's it's uh, that was somebody completely independent from the community, completely unswayed by all of that stuff that didn't have any information that was just gathering information. And that's what he gathered. Cause I was like, yeah, people are accusing us of having compete, like competed with local cartels. And he was like, I heard nothing about that. Not a single thing about it. Um, which is interesting. I wish. And, and they, when they asked me about like Nathan Freeman's theory, there's like that scene where I'm just like, mm. And then they're just like, they basically made it seem like I accepted that theory, but I followed that up with the story that I just mentioned. And it's just Mm -hmm. like, okay, yeah, but there was that. Um, The other thing was, is like, I will say the series was accurate to what each character felt was happening at the time. Whether or not that lined up with reality is a whole nother matter. Um, the one real big flaw that I would say with the series is that they tried to make everybody that was involved with it happy, which was impossible, um, without skewing the truth of the story. For example, I wish they would have been more honest about how bad my relationship with John was. There are a lot of people that came out of that series like, wow, it's so romantic. No, it wasn't. It was daily hell. Um very abusive and there was a lot of stuff that I talked about in that final interview that I could tell Todd was surprised I could see the look of shock on his face as I told him that wasn't included because they didn't want to hurt John's family Mm -hmm. which I I guess I understand but it's it leads to a somewhat disingenuous view of what really happened the other thing is um it made it seem like Anarchapulco died after 2020 without Nathan Freeman's guidance and that the attendance was so low because of that. No, the attendance was low because we were in a bear market. <laughs> um, the conference did not die. And in fact, like after 2020, the conference became like, I wouldn't continue working for the conference if it was the same drama drug filled party that it was it's actually remarkably drama free at this point it's um everybody on the teams required to read the four agreements and practice the four agreements and working with each other and if they don't we don't continue to work with people like we have a really good dynamic on the team and it got a lot better um and it's not like they didn't have footage we let them in in 2022 and they just they stopped it at 2020 um, and it's just like, okay, I guess, uh, and they made it basically seem like what happened with Nathan Freeman killed Nathan Freeman, but the reality was, as far as the liver failure is concerned, he was jaundiced when I met him in 2016. Um, he was day drinking when I met him in 2016, and even beyond that, the way he left Anarchapulco, I have seen... I've talked to a lot of people and I've also seen proof of what these people all say. And a lot of these people 
all have the same story, but they don't fucking like each other. And there's, like, actual, like, electronic proof to back it up. Um, he rage quit the conference. Jessica was literally hired to handle the annoying, like, logistical admin stuff, the spreadsheets, the budgeting, the, the not fun stuff. And he was going to be kept on at the same salary to handle like the to be the face of the conference to 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 be the cat herder to do the fun stuff and she was going to handle like making contracts and you know like making sure we follow through on agreements and making sure we stay in budget and like all of that stuff and he got threatened he decided to rage quit and i i've seen the email in which he rage quit um and then the reason he got locked out of his email was because he was messaging sponsors and speakers telling them not to be involved with Anarchapulco. So, of course, we're going to, you know, revoke his Anarchapulco email address at that point. Um, and that's what really happened there. It was he quit and he regretted it. And it's one of those things where, like, had he come back to Jeff and apologized for, like, trying to sabotage the conference he would have been allowed back on the team in the same role that he was in. Um, so he hmm. wasn't pushed out of the conference. The conference did not die without Nathan Freeman. Uh, I feel bad for his kids. I was definitely pretty angry for his kids when he died because it's one of those things where, like, I, I've been through some pretty horrible stuff, as everybody knows and is well aware and I didn't give up and I didn't have kids to keep me going. Whereas he basically like things mm. got hard for him and he just, just let himself go completely and died. And now his kids are growing up without a dad. And I think that's, I think that's a pretty shitty thing to do. Um, yeah. Even if you are upset, if your feelings are hurt. So all in all, I think, I, I think it could have been a lot worse. I think a lot of these people that are, pissed about how dramatic and sensationalist it is are also people that were only involved for short bursts of time like yeah. a few weeks to a few months a year at most and it's like okay guys like but i was living in it i was living in the weirdness all the time and it was definitely weird and it was definitely dramatic and that's what happens when a bunch of broken people try to badly do community together in a place where anything fucking goes. Um, yeah, no, yeah, you're, yeah, you're, so. no, you're, you're, that's, that was the first thing I noticed. Like, and I wasn't there, but, but a couple months or a yeah, month and a half in, in Acapulco. But um, yeah, I got there and, and Henza basically gave me the rundown on kind of the, I was like, hold on, this is, this is going on there. Really? And then, and then, yeah, like the, I, I remember most of our, most of the times when we went, went over to your, to your place, um, a lot of the time, like it was conversation about that or something along those lines. So it was a, it's, it's, it was very much a, a very, and it was, yeah, crazy shit. I like get yeah, crazy shit, you know, regarding Paul and all that, um, that you, you know, you wouldn't believe it unless you like actually, like, I didn't believe it the first time I heard it really. It just seemed kind of wild. Um, it's like, well, I thought this is like, you know, paradise of, you know, freedom paradise, but no, it, it definitely didn't just, it definitely wasn't that. Um, Alicia, yeah, yeah, definitely not. Um, so yeah, the, the drama was definitely, it was definitely there. Um, I guess the, the only thing that I, um, and I, I appreciate all that. Um, cause I, I guess I, yeah, I didn't have all that, that insight, but I guess the one thing I noticed, um, was, um, yeah, if it was only, um, so they portrayed like Anarchapulco as kind of like a party and drugs thing for, for a lot of it. And that would have been kind of problematic for me if they didn't have, cause you, you were a really good balancing point to that, um, to where like, you know, the, to the, like, I guess the, the Agora stuff. So, um, I thought like in terms of like balance, like I, cause obviously that stuff does happen there. They have to show it to like, it's, it's, it's like, it's part of, you know, Anarchapulco. Um, but yeah, I think you were a really good balance point to that. So I made it, it made it a lot more fun. Uh, was my perspective but that's that's really all i have to add on um i guess on the final product for my for my from my vantage point yeah it's um there was definitely it was it was fucking weird watching it um really surreal watching all of that and just being like because like i grew up watching hbo so like and hbo has had that same like intro logo for at least 20 years <laughs> where it's like a what noise and it shows the hbo and then it goes into my fucking life story and i'm like 
what the fuck alternate universe have <laughs> I ended up on? Like, <laughs> and it's and it's wild. It's really wild to consider. Um, and Henza and I, like, because Henza lives near me now. We talk about the irony of it and how how funny it is. And because, like, Henza's still fucking Henza and I'm still, you know, me. Um, and it's a funny thing where in regards to the series, it's just... It's fucking wild to consider. Um, my, you know, and my teacher, he thinks it's wild because he's now a part of my story. And also my boyfriend, you know, he saw me first for the first time on the series, came and met me. We ended up falling in love. And now occasionally he'll rewatch one of the episodes. Like he showed one of the episodes to his grandpa, <laughs> who's like statist as hell. And his grandpa was just like, what in the fuck are you doing? Like, what in the fuck? Which he's the anarchist black sheep of the family, but mm -hmm. it's weird for him as well because he watches it and he's just like, wow. So I'm a part of this story now. It's kind of surreal. Um, but it's just kind of like, it is what it is. I think, and I think the story is only going to get better because when I get my legal situation fixed, and I'm able to go back to the U.S. and get my passport. Henza will be the one taking me. And I intend on vlogging that because why not? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it'll be like, here's me crossing the border after eight years of living as a fugitive in Mexico. And I'm looking forward to that conversation. Honestly, I know mm -hmm. I'm going to be interrogated for hours by border control. <laughs> as they're like, where's your passport? And I'm like, I've never had one. And they're like, when did you go to Mexico? And I'm like, 2016. And they're like, what? <laughs> Hold on. Uh, yeah. yeah. That's crazy. Yeah, it'll be fun. It'll be a good moment. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I'll mention, it's, it's funny. Henza posted in the Paznia chat. Uh, he, I guess uh, uh, he's got a pizza joint now, um, <laughs> which is pretty cool. He does. Um, you know, pizza Henza. There in uh, somewhere somewhere in Mexico, posted there in uh, in the Paznia chat. It's amazing. Um, never would have expected that, but yeah, there's a you know Paznia friendly pizza joint that you know gives you d discounts for paying for pizza and Bitcoin or Monero. Um, so that's it's a pretty neat thing. <laughs> yeah, I, I go over there all the time, and I'm harassing him. Um, I make jokes because like Henza and I kind of have a pizza war going because, as you know, I used to serve pizza in Acapulco. Um, uh, it was yeah. actually one of my, like, most popular things I do at that restaurant. But Henza, you know, he goes on Facebook and is like, yeah, so um, my pizza is better than Lily's because she uses too much garlic in it. But, like, he doesn't use any garlic in his sauce. He uses, like, this very, very simple marinara sauce. So I'm always giving him shit, like, the pizza would be better if you added garlic. And he's always like, well, I'm only selling these for like 40 pesos of pizza. So I got to meet my bottom line. And I'm like, Henza, it costs like two pesos to add garlic to your pizza for like the entire day. Don't give me that shit, you know, <laughs> but the pizzas are like pretty decent. I would definitely add garlic. Um, <laughs> but like, it's, it's good. And yeah, you can definitely pay in crypto. And also gold backs. Oh, um, gold backs too, right. I know that because yeah. my, yeah, my, my roommate gave me a gold back. He bought some, my roommate bought some from Henza and he's like, I don't know how to use these and he owed me money for something. And he gave me a gold back and I'm like, what the fuck am I going to do with this? Um, just making jokes mostly. And then Henza's pizza place opened. So I took it over there and I got pizzas in exchange for it. Um, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's a, uh, it is funny. It's not completely surprising to me that he started a pizza place. Um, just knowing Henzi, he was talking about doing that before he ever went carnivore. And it's something uh. he does with his girlfriend, partner. Well, she's, they're not like engaged, but they are life partners, like staying together for good. So yeah, it's, mm -hmm. it's funny to see Henza like go from like lazy bachelor to like, hard-working family man because nice. he's got a stepdaughter now so it's like it, it's it's real funny it's cute but it's funny to like to see that shift in him over the last few years mm -hmm. yeah 
for sure. So I guess one of the one other curious question, which I didn't have this in my outline, but I, I know the like the my way of eating is is definitely you know definitely falls into um, a lot of things like some 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 stuff we talked about um, privately, hormones and, and things of that nature. But I, I want to add like so I I, I did carn I learned about carnivore from you from you guys there in Acapulco, and I did that for a while. Um, and then I went more hardcore like nose to tail, really high quality um, animal products. And then I just recently kind of switched again. Um, but I'm curious, uh, I guess, which, which your, I guess where you've been at with that. Um, I guess what your, um, what your experiences are. Um, cause yeah, I mean, you, you look healthy. I mean, you looked, you looked in the documentary, you look very different. So, um, you look a lot more healthier. So I'm curious which, what's your, you know, we, we talked about some of the, I guess more of the, um, some of it, but yeah, what's, uh, what's, what's, what's your way of eating now? So yeah. Um, that last part of the documentary was filmed about six months before I quit weed. And I'm mentioning that because that was a huge part of like the shift in my diet. Cause during those days I was still eating very limited. I like, cause I've always kind of been able to tolerate corn. So I was basically eating beef tacos and that was it for like years. Um, cause I did carnivore for about two years and about six months of that was lion diet. But mm-hmm. I mean, I love to cook. And I got, I got really bored. It was fucking with my mental health. But also part of why I went so hardcore was, as anybody who watches the series can see, like, I had really horrible skin, especially in 2018 and 2019. But it didn't really get that much better. It improved maybe 20% um, with the carnivore diet. It never really got better. My digestive system never really stabilized like it was supposed to despite the fact that I was being like really really strict with it so I was like okay obviously for me something different needs to happen um so I kind of came off of it I experimented a lot not really a lot worked corn worked certain vegetables worked a few fruits worked but I was still very limited and I got to a point where I was just tired of it um and my best friend who's who I produce in Acapulco with Kat, she messages me a study that she found that implies because she and I were both dealing like I had had acute pancreatitis maybe two months before this and then she got it and we were she found a study that said that in chronic cannabis use you can deal with acute pancreatitis so I kept, I looked deeper and apparently chronic cannabis use negatively in fact impacts the Um, digestive system in that it gets your pancreas to stop producing enzymes and by that point I started taking digestive enzymes and boiled down to okay a lot of you know the reason why I have a hard time digesting food is actually because I have no digestive enzymes Um, and so I was like okay that day I decided all right I'm gonna finish out what like what weed I have and I'm gonna take a six-week break and um That was in June of 2022, and I haven't consumed any cannabis since. It took me about, like, two weeks to, like, enjoy eating again after that. But within, like, by the end of those two weeks, I was, you know, at this point, I was already doing circus stuff. And before, I was like, oh, I need it for my anxiety. Well, like, I immediately stopped having panic attacks, um, which panic attacks were really regular for me, you know, before I quit. And I was like, oh, okay, well, maybe I'll keep, you know, I'll, I'll keep this up. And then, yeah, by like two months later, I was able to eat chocolate and stuff like that, avocados, some other things that I really missed that I just wasn't able to consume rice. And it was just slowly like was able to introduce more things, but still not as much as I wanted to. I still was fairly limited for a while. Uh, then this year in... In Acapulco, actually, I started microdosing psilocybin, and through that process, I broke up with the relationship that I had, which, you know, like, I wish the guy the best, but the responsibility for providing, like, financially and everything was put on me, and also I was responsible for his emotional state. There was a lot of conflicts, especially relating to my former life. Um, He was very jealous of John, which is weird because he was dead, but it was a constant thing you know and he'd get upset with me like oh it, you talk about it a lot and it's like well how am I supposed to live in a relationship with somebody where I cannot talk about eight years of my adult life literally I'd spent 
all but one year of my adult life with that man. Like, how do I not talk about those times? Um, and yeah, it was through through those few weeks during Intercapulco. Sorry, during Intercapulco last year, I was like, okay, I'm I'm not comfortable with this relationship. I want this relationship to end. And the, that time, I met the man that I'm now dating. And uh, about my birthday, right around my birthday, me and this guy broke up. And this is important because a lot of things dietarily changed for me right after because my stress level went from like here on a constant basis to like here. Um, so it was it was a huge shift because, you know, it's hard enough to be living the lifestyle that I do with how much work I do with how I train um, being who I am stress wise without having to manage somebody else's feelings about it. And yeah, it's one of those things where like at this point, I, he still hasn't gotten over it almost a year later. He's publicly accusing me of cheating and all this other stuff. Mm. Whereas the reality is I was afraid to end the relationship because I knew he would, uh, he would make problems for me. And he did, he broke into my house, all these other things after I broke up with him. Um, but all of that is mentioned because pretty much immediately after that breakup, about a month after that, I was able to eat eggs again without discomfort. I was adding more things in. And in last May, my now boyfriend came back from middle of fucking Europe again for a second time in a year. Um, but this time directly to spend time with me. And we ended up spending five weeks together. And he's a very like, I went from being the person who I had to make all the plans and provide all the money to do the plans and like all of that stuff to um, this man. He, he came with a plan and was like, you just come and enjoy. I'll pay for everything. And it was like, all these, all these restaurants and stuff. And it was like completely different. Like he treated me like a queen. And I'm mentioning this because at one of these restaurants, accidentally I ordered beef taco for breakfast. I was still eating somewhat limited, but I was opening up more and the beef taco came with black beans on it. And I hadn't had black beans in years and, uh, or any beans in years. And I got halfway through the taco before I realized it. And like the panic set in and I was like, Oh fuck, I'm about to be suffering mm. um and i didn't suffer at all <laughs> and it was like a week or two later we went to a different city we, we kind of like traveled around during this month and he picked out this this cafe that he wanted to go to for for breakfast and we get there and i looked at the menu and it's literally all like high quality grilled cheese on sourdough bread there was literally zero other options and I was like, I started to panic. And he's like, I don't doubt that you had food problems before. Like, I, I don't doubt that in the slightest. He goes, but I think you can eat what you want at this point and be fine. Mm -hmm. And I was like, well, I don't know. And he's just like, he's like, baby, just eat a sandwich. You'll be fine. And if not, you can be mad at me. But just, just try it. Just trust me. And I ate a sandwich and I was fine. So uh, I can eat everything now <laughs> without discomfort, without like inflammation issues. I don't have the like the headache and like the blood sugar and the fatigue issues that I used to have. Um, at the same time, I quit birth control and I decided to take charge of my hormones and regulate through that. And it got my skin got pretty bad again there for a few months, but I started eating like a higher protein diet, still allowing myself to have carbs. Like, you know, if I wanted a piece of cake, I ate a fucking piece of cake because mm -hmm. I found that it's actually more stressful to the body, at least a woman's body to restrict the way that I was than it is to just have the thing, you right. know, every so often. And at this point, like my skin's pretty much cleared up. Like, I don't have really any more body acne the way I did. I get a little bit of hormonal acne that I'm still fixing around my, like, chin and jawline. But even that, like, I'm sure you can tell and remember the way it was back in 2018 compared to how it is now. Um, 
but yeah, it's just been a whole thing going from eating literally only beef and salt to now. The only things that I still avoid are anything with soy in it. I still mm-hmm. avoid, and I I avoid I avoid like emulsifiers mm-hmm. like xanthan gum and guar gum and uh, any lecithin, soy lecithin, sunflower lecithin, modified mm-hmm. corn starch. If it's if stuff's got stuff like that in it, seed oils, I, yep. I still avoid seed oils. Same. Yeah. Um, but I eat a pretty balanced like whole foods diet you know i do consume a decent amount of meat still but i'm also eating bread and pasta and like i mentioned i fucking love cake at this point like (laughs) i missed cake so much um but when it's done well and it's high quality like there's obviously you don't want to eat it for all of your meals you know so balance is key but i have reached a state of balance at this point and everything with my body is working better i'm building muscle um i'm i'm very strong at this point and yeah it's it's been a long journey i do think that carnivore was useful to figure out like hey i don't have to suffer through my days the way that i was doing but I also, like, when I started it, I was convinced that I was going to have to eat that way for the rest of my life. Yeah. And that everybody should eat that way. And now I absolutely don't feel that yeah. way. Like, if you feel good eating what you are eating, you're not dealing with headaches, chronic pain, weight gain, like, fatigue, all of that stuff. If that's not a part of your daily life. Just keep doing what you're doing. Um and that's pretty much, that's my rule of thumb now. Like if something starts giving me brain fog or if I'm just not feeling good or not able to focus or like digestively anything weird happens, that's when I know I'm eating something I shouldn't. Um, so it was a useful journey, but it was a long journey. And the biggest thing really was reducing stress and getting mm-hmm. off weed. <laughs> That's, inter- so that's interesting. I don't think I'll yeah. ever consume that. Yeah, that's that's uh, that's yeah. amazing. Um, that's yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, yeah, I'm there with you. I mean, I, I went, I was doing like zero 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 carb carnivore. Like, I guess not zero because no satale. If you eat liver, or brain, or something like that, you're going to get a gram or two of a carb or something like that. Um, but uh, yeah, I was. Um, you know, I'm, I'm still trying to deal with the so-called, um, type one diabetes and, and yeah, I can certainly attest to, um, yeah, when I, when my body's craving sugar, like when my blood sugar goes low, it feels like it's, it's, it goes in panic mode. It's not good. It's not a good feeling. Stress hormones, all of that. So I can, I, so yeah, my, my rule of thumb now is, you know, listen to my body more like, yeah, like, like the blood sugar is important, but I plan on getting rid of this. So if, if I was going to have it for 40 years, yeah, I might, I might worry more about like the levels, but even like Eastern medicine, they, they didn't worry so much about the levels. They worried about why the glucose is, is doing the doing what it's doing um but uh anyway i guess the there was one other interesting thing that uh um that you yeah so i guess the, the other part of this is so yeah i was going to go either high fat or high car like i was going to go high fat um carnivore to try to deal with the diabetes because there's an outfit um in uh, europe it's called paleo medicine and they do a high fat paleo diet um and they've i guess within within very short diagnosis of type 1 diabetes they can reverse it but you can with um you can that's that's been di- uh, that that's been demonstrated here, but for, for someone that's had it for like fifteen or sixteen years, that's a little more difficult. Um, but I came across a, a guy named Dr. Ray Pete, and he was uh, he wrote a book called Nutrition for Women back in like nineteen eighty three, and he was like the foremost expert um, when the entire industry was like pushing estrogen on women. He was telling them no, like estrogen's a problem. You need to get progesterone, and the entire industry was just you know dosing estrogen, and uh, <laughs> so like he was um, so yeah he so he's big on. Um, so I take I take progesterone every day, which which again modern pharmaceuticals like he for progesterone like you ask him a question on anything it's fun he's like a one trick pony it's like progesterone aspirin um, thyroid hormone or like the three like uh, or, an orange juice and ice cream um, like those are two of like the it's like his his like staple things but like the the Ray P is is a lot more expansive it's about optimizing metabolism it's called like a, it's called like generally like it's yeah, maximizing metabolism metabolism essentially and that's usually done by thyroid um, and hormones so. Um, yeah, it's, uh, so yeah, I'm eating more high carb now than I, um, I really have. And like, uh, you know, high quality, as long as it's, um, and another thing you point out that's really, really good. As long as it's high quality, um, you're pretty much, pretty much all right. Um, cause yeah, it's those, those low quality, low quality ingredients, um, that'll really get you. So, um, yeah, sounds like we're kind of yeah. treading, treading similar paths. 
Yeah, for sure. I've heard of Reiki, and I remember when I heard of it, it was when I was carnivore. We had a friend that was into it, and we were like, man, that is the exact opposite of everything we've been taught, yep. like, in terms of the carnivore stuff. Like, what in the fuck? But the reality is, like, if you're just eating making sure that you're getting high quality food like you don't see me buying the boxed stuff at the store you know like the cookies and stuff Mm -hmm. like if i have a cookie i either go and buy it from a bakery i know uses high quality ingredients um or i just fucking make a cookie and i make it with high quality ingredients you know it's 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 not that and it's always better you know especially and it's easier i think for me here in mexico because we have we have bakeries that do sourdough bread or like where i buy my chocolate from i literally buy my chocolate at a candy factory it's kind of like it's kind of like an old-timey like wonka factory that makes mexican sweets you know they make like ate which is kind of like if you boil jam too long it becomes this like you know, this brick Mm -hmm. and you eat it with cheese and stuff. But that's just one of the many things like Rompope, they make all of that, but they also, they make high quality chocolate that doesn't use soy lecithin or any of their emulsifying agents. Um, And they sell it in this like climate controlled room where you walk in and during the summer it's air conditioned and it smells like chocolate and you can pick it by the piece. Um, That same place also has a bakery. And so when I get cake, I, you know, when I get a craving for cake, I go there because I know that they're using old recipes and old timey ingredients and the cakes are super high quality. Um, and there's a difference in the way that you feel, you know, like, sure, I'll get a bit of a sugar rush, but like, I'm not fatigued and put into a coma the way that like mm-hmm. it would be if I went and bought a cake from like Walmart or you know, like one of these treats from the OXO, which is the the convenience store that exists everywhere here. There's there's OXO. there's a huge difference. There's such a huge difference. Um, and I'm actually a little nervous for like when I do come back to the United States. I'm only planning on being there for a few weeks. I'm gonna get my passport, and then Hens is gonna drive me to Ohio, um, and. I'm going to leave a bunch of stuff in Ohio and visit family. And I'm honestly really nervous about like how to source decent food while I'm there without paying an arm and a leg for the weeks that I'm there, because I know that the good food in the United States is so much more mm-hmm. expensive than the good food here is by like so, so four thankfully, or five times. <laughs> yes. And it's, and it's impossible. To, it's, it's almost impossible. There's only one place that Oro and I will go out to eat to, and it's a farm to farm to farm to a table place, like a 40 minutes away. And like 80% of the time I'm good. There's been one or two times where I've, they've done something. I'm not sure, but it's just one of the risks. We do it very rarely. It's the only place we actually go out to. So yeah, I, I cook like 99% of my own meals for that reason. Um, yeah, it's it's not easy, but thankfully we're working on that with the Pasni Map and Directory because like uh one of the one of the, the things on the local local health, health food stores, um like uh, local farms that you know may have raw dairy, um or eat that sell meats, homesteads that sell meats um in the area. So hopefully whenever that happens, the map the map will be more fleshed out, and you might just be able to check out the Pasni Map and and uh, you know find place to get your meat there, or get your your uh, your foods there. So that I did have a like. question about the mm-hmm. Pas. I, I had a question about the Pasnia map because um, sure. I was thinking of the idea of adding locations and does it need to be places that like exclusively accept crypto or no, no. can it be mm. places that I know that like, for example, where I, where I practice my circus classes, um, my teacher, he's actually, you know, pretty normy, but him and all of the people there are so accepting and protective of me that I would personally put it there as a, yeah. as a place where like an anarchist can go and be themselves and for sure. Yeah. Yes. Not worry yep. about. Yep. Exactly. So like the local health All food right. store lady, I'm if gonna, she, she, she would, she probably wants us, if we're going to sell stuff there, she would probably prefer us to get a, a permit, but she's a nice lady that I love to do business with. Um, it's the only place I shop in town. Um, same with like the, the place I get raw milk from. Um, like, yeah, they're obviously status, but they're great people. And I'd love to send Pazians there to, to get stuff. So yeah, I'm, yeah, exactly. Stuff like that be, would be great. Um, for sure. Yeah. I have a few places like that where it's just like, 
it's it's funny because like in this in this movement and i'm sure you've experienced this too especially when you first get into this movement there's a big emphasis on like self-sufficiency and independence and i can do all this by myself and i don't need nobody but the biggest lesson that i've truly learned in the last five years um is that i do absolutely need people you know like people like kat and even you like you gave, gave me work in 2019 when everybody else was too afraid to hire me well that work is how i survived you know or all the people that donated to me like immediately after the murder or who have randomly donated since all the people that have supported my business um but also just like the friends that i've made you know like i this year um there's been some beautiful things that have happened well this year as in 2023 there were some really beautiful things here and there that happened but it was a really hard year year for me you know like it started off kind of turbulent got better you know I fell in love but the universe gate fucking joke is just like hi we're gonna give you the most healthy and fulfilling relationship you've ever had but by the way he's literally on the other side of the planet, 90, 98% of the time, you're going to be lonely as fuck. Mm. And without these people, like without my roommate, without Henza being close by, um, without the people that I train with in circus, this year would have fucking sucked. You know, like I have felt so loved. And it's funny because like I posted some videos on social media about this. But after my performance in July with my with my circus people, um they were all like kind of watching from the inside and I had, a, I had my first solo. It was a solo on trapeze. And when I came back in and they were already doing this for months at like parties and stuff, they scream, yeah, or Lily or Mana, yeah, it is Mexicana, which means Lily sister, you are Mexican. And they like all bombarded me and hugged me singing that at me. And it's just like the community that I have now worldwide, you know, like, there are several people whose names I'll keep private for their privacy, but they know who they are that lent me bank accounts to be able to accept money. So I could get away from the relationship that I had at the beginning of the year. Um, There's people like in Acapulco that are still there that are like family to me, you know, like I have a, I have a Mexican dad in Acapulco that I've known for now eight years. I have a Spanish mom who I've known since the murder and she's kind of tough on me, you know, into mezcal ceremonies, but she's, she's, she's proud of like where I've gone, but all of these, like, we need community to really thrive in this world. If we all just try to fucking do everything ourselves, we end up miserable, angry, and bitter. Um, so yeah, I like that you've made this directory and I like that it's not just a, oh, only if they accept crypto or only this, like, no, if they're good people that do good business and are trustworthy and that, you know, aren't, you know, gonna, you can trust them to know, like, like anybody that I go to my gym with, they could just call and have me deported mm-hmm. and they all know my story now. And the exact opposite of what I feared would happen has happened. Basically they've embraced me. I've become closer to all of them. Now Um, they invite me into their homes, to their family functions, to their birthday parties. They're coming with me to Acapulco now. So we're going to perform together. And it's just like, it's, it's been really heartwarming. It's been Mm -hmm. super heartwarming to like, just lean into that community aspect worldwide yeah no that that's definitely true and it's it's yeah it's it's interesting um cause, i mean so i i talked to a guy named uh, rex um he's doing he's got a really awesome greenhouse project basically kind of the pasney idea but he's he's built it's like a time like a greenhouse timeshare sort of thing so you go work there and then you get you get like a share like I, i'm not even gonna try to explain it but it's a really interesting thing in like trying to forego money um where you go like the your your the money is your labor um this kind of thing you put your time into it and you build it then you've got a place where you can a place where you can stay um, really cool idea, but that was, um, in the first, first podcast and that was, that was his thing. A lot, a lot of individuals, anarchists who are realizing the importance of community right now. Um, yeah, for sure. And, and same, same way here at, at Veritas. Um, we had, a 
we had someone move in, Bueller moved in a, a couple of years ago. And just recently, um, we have, a um, we have a, um, a father and a son here, Van Nomad. Um, they're, they've been here for the winter for a couple of months and, and it's, uh, it's cool to see. Um, cause I mean, that's how I started out. I know for sure it was basically me and Kyle doing podcasts back in like 2015. Um, and, uh, yeah, it wasn't like, uh, we weren't talking about, um, I mean, we're talking about direct action solutions, but basically like individual solutions. Cause I didn't have anyone around me at that time, really. He didn't have anybody. So, I mean, just trying to find freedom, you know, where we came by ourselves, but now we don't have to do that. We don't have to just like try to struggle by, um, we can do a lot better than that. Um, and we already are. So, um, keep going in that trip and a perfect right example of that is this fundraising thing you've been doing like with kyle like i experienced something similar to what he's experiencing because after the murder happened i didn't ask for money myself a bunch of other people messaged me and were like send me your crypto addresses we'll raise money for you and a huge amount of money was raised for me over those weeks um to support me without even and that's really what like kind of broke my brain in regards to the, I have to do everything myself situation. Cause yeah, we don't. And the people, there are really good people in this community that do really want to help. And all you have to do is just be a good person and treat people right. And when you need it, people will be there. Like, and that's part of like, you know, I've had my differences with Jeff, for example, over the years, but Jeff, behind the scenes without taking any credit for it has helped me financially repeatedly. Like in 2021, he was so impressed by how much work that I did that he way overpaid me to do like one project. And I ended up getting a bunch of dental work done that I desperately needed because of it. Um, and then again, in 2022, I auctioned a painting trying to raise money for my lawyer and he paid he ended up paying for over half of my lawyer fee. Um, another person that I met in 2016, that was just a friend of ours. He lived with us for a while. This year, he messaged me like a few months after Anarchapulco and was like, how much do you owe for your lawyer? And I was like, well, about this much. And he's like, I'll pay it, you know? And it's like, it's, it's so to funny hear. to see. And I think it's like, yeah, I think it's like the second wave of this community because we, we all start off as individuals, but then we, at a certain point, we realize not only does it suck being all by yourself, it's just so much better having a good community of people you trust. And I know the biggest thing that I've gotten out of being involved in this movement is I have a long list of people that I know for a fact because I've had to that I can trust with my life. Hens is yep. one of those people. Cat's one of those people. I mean, shit, even in some ways, Berwick has been one of those people, which is kind of funny to consider. You know, some people consider him like this evil shithead capitalist, but he's not just helped me. I know quite a few other people that, like, aren't well-known people that he's just given large amounts of money to to help them get out of a shitty situation and you don't see him gloating about it, which is interesting mm. to me. Um, yeah. Cause if he was really this egotistical shithead that everybody thought he was, he would be gloating about it, but he wasn't. Um, yeah. It's just, it's beautiful to see that shift and to see people coming together and like, you know, I have so many people that I will always consider lifelong friends, even if I only see them like once a decade, you know, it's like, yep. It's a beautiful thing to see. Um, yeah. I'm at a very grateful mm -hmm. point in my life. <laughs> yeah, certainly. Well, yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's amazing. Um, it's all, all amazing stuff. Well, Lily, I don't have uh, really anything else. Um, I'm not, I guess we, we went into areas I didn't really plan on, which is always what's fun about doing these. But um, I guess uh, um, from what we covered so far, from, or stuff we didn't cover, um, I guess, yeah, any, any other uh, topics or anything else you'd like to, uh, to, to talk about before we uh, begin to wrap up? Um, no, other than, like... I'm always looking for more side hustle work and possibly even more after Anarchapulco because it's one of those things where I'm going to totally understand if Jeff decides to end it, but I am also going to need to replace that income. Uh, so if yeah. anybody needs help with WordPress or podcast and video audio editing or copywriting or social media management or really like 
really fucking anything, I, I am always down to help. And I like to work on as many projects as possible, partially because I, I kind of get bored easily. So when I have a lot of different things to do, I'm always interested in what I'm doing. But yeah, that's the only thing mm -hmm. that I have. Um, I think we covered everything pretty well. Cool. Very good. And uh, the website's still highly functional growth. Uh, people want to reach out to you? Yep. Highlyfunctionalgrowth.com. It has all my social media linked there. It also has like information on how to hire me um, and just general updates. I should put more life updates, but I've kind of gone from being like blogging everything of every second of every day to where as my life gets better, and I've seen memes that imply this, like the better your life gets, the less you feel the need to post. Yeah. yeah. And that's definitely been true for me. I have just like... I have a hard time like updating because it's like all the good things that are happening behind the scenes. I've kind of like, they're a little sacred to me. So I've kind of kept them to myself. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I should update there more. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, Lily, thanks so much for, for coming on. It was, it was great. Uh, we'll have to do it uh, again, hopefully in the near future when, um, you know, hopefully uh, your legal situation gets figured out and, uh, uh, we can we can get the next update then, um, and uh, yeah, hopefully it's not four or five years again. Um, we'll we'll, we'll not, not let that happen. Um, but uh, yeah, thanks thanks a lot, Honestly, Lily. It was great. My, yeah, go ahead. Both, mm -hmm. yeah, both me and my lawyer think it's going to happen before the end of 2024. Wow. I'm hoping okay, that in quick. the next few months, but mm -hmm. we'll see. We'll see. Yeah, I mean, it's it's been a year in the making already in terms of having hired her and us working on it, so it should happen this year. Wow. So we'll see. Wow. Well, that'd be big. That'd be big. So, um, awesome, Lily. Thanks a lot. And uh, we'll, we'll obviously be in touch. Um, I've got I've got uh, some ideas for. Um, just got to get around to it. Um, here in the next few next few days or week, I, I I've certainly got more more work for you. So, um, yeah. Thanks thanks for that too. Sounds Appreciate. Good. It. Always good to have uh, have someone I can trust and rely on for um, for freelance work. Um, it's uh, it's great. But uh, yeah, as far as uh, I guess the, the general audience here, um, thank you so much for tuning in. I will mention uh, the uh, um, the time, I guess the uh, timely reminder uh, until January 24th that uh, Kyle, uh, my former and uh, future Bonnie podcast co-host, is uh, in need of, um, I guess uh, we've got 1302 out of the set out of the needed 1700 to secure his new Bonnie home base. Um, so, uh, would, uh, love to see that, uh, you know, get taken care of even the next day or two, uh, which would be great. Um, I'll have this podcast out in the next day or two. So I guess that'd be four days, four days or so by the time this is, by the time this is out and, and listened to. But, um, anyway, if you want to go check out the full story and, uh, find ways to donate, whether it's Bitcoin, Monero, uh, Fiat, um, we even had a silver donation. So whatever it is, vonniepodcast.com forward slash Kyle, uh, all the information is there. And, uh, then yeah, just, um, Pazni, Pazni updates. Uh, the Pazni map and directory is available the first iteration. Reach out to me if you haven't gotten your login credentials yet, and think you should. And uh, I guess the last thing I'll mention is I, I've been working on today, and it might actually be you know be the first iteration might be done in the, in the next day or two. But I made a uh, some, something I call Pazni a list since I've got the uh, I guess the account set up on the Pazni site now. It's called Pazni a list. It's the it's Craigslist for the second realm. And uh, it looks pretty badass so far. I'm excited about it. And I'm excited to share it with all of you guys. But uh, in the meantime, VonniePodcast.com is a place to go for all things Vonnie, Liberty Attack Publications, Liberty Attack uh, For all things, uh, for books, bundles, privacy tools like ghost phones and ghost pads, uh, or as apothecary items, stuff we grow here on the homestead, uh, put in um, you know, medicine form. And uh, then uh, the most recent edition, Canned Goods, uh, made with, uh, with uh, stuff made here or created or I guess uh, grown here at Veritas. So lots of stuff, libertarianattack.com. And then, uh, yes, uh, join the second realm, Paznia, P-A-Z-N-I-A.com. Um, all the information is there. And, uh, oh, actually, I guess the last Paznia update, there is a Paznia Monero fund now, too, a general Monero fund. We have a, a general Bitcoin fund, but there is a general Monero fund. So if you want to make a Monero donation, um, that is the place to do it. But, again, that's that will all go to Kyle. Um, anything donated there will go to Kyle until the 24th. So, um, yeah, thanks so much, guys. Uh, until next time, cheers. Because that's really the issue that we're dealing with, with these, you know, ghost phones, ghost pads, whatever, is that there's no way that you can organize with, with other people and have these distributed tribes if you have a snitch in your pocket all the time. Mm -hmm. People are literally wearing wires all the time. They have a snitch in their pocket and they're trying to do clandestine things. 
that's never going to work. You know, I'm focused on this project now because I really see how the unfettered flow of communication is what really has prompted this, you know, shift in consciousness. And that if this does, if this can't continue this way and people can't communicate freely with each other, then all the dis distributed networks that have formed um, aren't going to be very effective and they're not going to, uh, they're not going to be able to do what they could do. Um, if you can't communicate, especially when you're basically part of a dispersed tribe at this point, if you can't communicate without being monitored, it basically hamstrings anything, you know, anything going forward. Step up your privacy and order a ghost phone today. Just visit libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone, again libertyunderattack.com forward slash ghost phone. And make sure to keep a lookout for more ghost pads, privacy tools, freedom boxes, and more. Libertyunderattack.com is the website. Liberty Under Attack Publications. Share your story. Find your freedom.